Greetings, scholars, and welcome to Following the Gong, a podcast of the Schreier Honors College at Penn State. Following the Gong takes you inside conversations with our scholar alumni to hear their story so you can gain career and life advice and expand your professional network. You can hear the true breadth of how scholar alumni have gone on to shape the world after they ran the gong and graduated with honors and learn from their experiences so you can use their insights in your own journey. This show is proudly sponsored by the Scholar Alumni Society, a constituent group of the Penn State Alumni Association. I'm your host, Sean Goheen, class of 2011 and college staff member. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. If you're a regular listener, welcome back. Bob Perna, class of 1985, serves as the Senior Vice President, General Counsel, and Secretary at Knowles Corporation in Illinois. Bob joined Following the Gone from the Chicago suburbs to share his experiences as an early university scholar at both Penn State Chenango and University Park. Bob provided insights on success in law school as a business student and the work of in-house attorneys in a business setting. He also shared perspectives on working for a primarily business-to-business, or B2B, company as a major supplier for household name products. This episode will be helpful for any scholar, and particularly those starting at a smaller Commonwealth campus, majoring in business disciplines, and those looking into legal or business careers, particularly in supply-focused or leadership roles. Bob's full bio and a detailed breakdown of the topics discussed are available in the show notes on your podcast app. With that, let's dive into our discussion with Bob following the gong. Joining me here today on Following the Gong is Bob Perna. Bob, thank you so much for joining me today all the way from the greater Chicago area. Um, My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So, Bob, I always like to start by asking how our guests first came to Penn State and for you, what was then the University Scholars Program? Uh, Sure. I uh, grew up in uh, Sharon, Pennsylvania. We had a uh, branch campus, Shenango Valley campus and in our town. Uh, my bro- my older brother went to Penn State and uh, it didn't take but one or two campus visits and maybe a football game to convince me that uh, that's where I wanted to go. It was such a vibrant campus, so much going on, a beautiful setting. But I think also the fact that we did have the branch campus in our hometown, you know, let me kind of continue working part-time, live at home, kind of save some money. And so it was just, you know, the combination of the two of those, a great world-class institution and a, a local branch campus where I could, you know, spend a couple years and uh, before going to the University Park that really attracted me to Penn State. Well, I think you might be our first guest that attended the Shenango campus. We've had quite a few guests, myself included, who started at a campus that was not University Park. But what was it like for you coming from such a small campus like Shenango? And even in the the 1980s and 1990s, University Park was still really big. So how did you navigate that? And what advice would you give for students or prospective students who are maybe in a similar part of their path like you were? Sure. Well, I, I thought it was a great way to kind of ease into uh, kind of a you know Big Ten college uh, setting. Being able to spend a couple years locally in a smaller setting when it did come time to move to the to University Park, I had a group of friends. You know, we knew we, you know we I, my roommates were from Shenango campus, so you know we knew people already, and uh, that really helped with the with the transition. We knew folks that had transferred up the year before, and you know had visited them on occasion, and so it really allowed us to kind of to ease into, I'd say, more the social scene. I think the academic rigor was the same at the branch campus. So, you know, prepared you well for that. But but the but sort of the social scene, the kind of how you get around, where's this building, where's that building, you know, I was able to make a few visits beforehand, you know, just through different events and classes and visits. So I felt comfortable with the campus and then knowing people there, you know, kind of made life a little easier to, to move into a kind of a Big Ten school. Definitely. I think any chance you get to come to University Park before being a student, whether it's for a football game or a thon or anything like that, always great to check it out. So Bob, were there any other kind of activities or opportunities that you were able to take advantage of once you got to University Park that helped you settle in, again, coming from a very small campus to, like you said, the social scene and kind of the outside of the classroom part that honestly is most of your time in reality. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And I, you know, I I, I guess I didn't answer your, your first question about the university scholar program, but that was a big, 
that was a big part of that transition as well. So like you said, at the time it was University Scholars Program. So forgive me if I <laughs> kind of re keep referring to it as that. This was in the early years, you know, the, it had only been kind of up and running for a few years. And I was invited to join my junior year when I was moving to campus. So kind of right off the bat, that gave me a, a, a group, a kind of a, you know, outside of the normal classroom of folks, you know, to kind of get to know. And so that you know, that helped in the transition as well. I also got involved in student government, the USG at the time, undergraduate student government, and uh, had represented the off-campus group. We were living, I was living in an apartment at the time. And and again, you know, just tried to get involved with a lot of the extracurriculars, you know, the groups and the activities that were available. And, and you know, that's, again, the great thing about a school like Penn State, there's just so much to offer. And so it was easy to kind of get involved in some of those things. So you've mentioned the academics quite a few times, and obviously it's a key part of not only the Schreier experience, but overall being a Penn State student. This is a world-class institution, as as you said. And I want to know, how did you come to pick your major? There's so many options. There's very few things Penn State doesn't offer at the undergraduate level. How did you pick what you wanted to study? Walk us through your thought process there. Yeah, yeah. It might have been a little uh, process of elimination, uh, frankly. Uh, I, you know, I, 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 I did not want to get into sort of the science and, and engineering kind of math aspect of things. I, I wasn't uh, sort of liberal arts kind of uh, bent, uh, but I kind of had an interest in business. And, you know, this was, this was the 80s and the stock market was really booming. A lot of finance related topics in the news, the SNL crisis, and, you know, just a lot was going on, inflation and so forth. And so, you know, it was, a, it was an area that interests me. And, and one of my uh, early classes was an accounting class and had a professor in Shenango campus that really kind of turned me on to, to finance and business and accounting. And, and, you know, from there, then it was, I think it was my first year that really said, hey, you know, I, I enjoyed this. And looking at the curriculum, then I kind of narrowed narrowed in on that area of finance. And I imagine this was right before the movie Wall Street came out. Too, <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, yeah, yeah you know, right. It, kinda... it was it was a sexy time for in finance. So a lot going on, right? I'm sure you still were able to find a really cool topic on your thesis. Tell us what you researched, Bob. But more importantly, I also want to hear how that influenced your career, especially going into law. Yeah. So uh, my thesis was... Uh, I think it was entitled Money Market Mutual Funds, the Reaction to the Money Market Deposit Account. Not as sexy as it sounds, or, or maybe it is, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, again, it's a little different era. You know, what, what came about in, in the time of kind of rising interest rates, we were at a period in the early 80s where banks were capped in terms of what they could offer in, in, in terms of interest on savings and checking accounts. And so this is in the day where you, you know, they couldn't give you interest, but they could give you a free toaster if you open an account or, you know, you know, gifts and things like that. Well, rates were going up and people were looking for places to put their money and money market mutual funds, which are still around today, uh, were a popular option for folks. They gave people an opportunity to get some yield, you know, fairly safe investments. And banks were losing a lot of deposits because of that, because they couldn't compete with their interest rates. And so in the early 80s, Congress through deregulation kind of opened up the, the banks from being able to offer more interest and offered these money market deposit accounts. So it was sort of the advent of that account in the early 80s and banks were able to pay more market interest rates. Well, you know, that phenomenon is what I kind of looked at from in my thesis and saying, how did the money market mutual funds react to this now? So they have a little competition uh, from the banks and being able to offer this. And what I found was their portfolio became a little more risky. So they tried to offer more yield. And of course, that means more risk. And for the money market mutual funds, although very safe investments, they began to, um, their duration of their investments sort of expanded, you know, they more longer term duration, trying to get more, more yield, you know, the, the government bonds and what they invested in tend to get, it'd be a little more riskier, not much. I mean, again, they were still rock solid, but their risk was expanding because they were now competing with these money market deposit accounts. So that was a basis for my thesis and uh, really, you know, kind of enjoyed the process. Uh, very, very rigorous. And I think, you know, that's a good crossover into the into law school and, and my career in law. It really did emphasize to me the rigor 
that you need when you do a thesis. It was my first real in-depth research project, frankly, at, at, you know, at that level. You know, the the precision, you know, how you use your words, how you support your your sentences, you know, your your observations, and and being able to defend those. So so it was very very uh, enlightening for me to kind of go through at that depth, where you know it was a year year and a half process. The organization, uh, you know, kind of, this is not something you do the week before. You know, <laughs> you know, getting the resources, meeting with my advisor. So really, um, you know, that what I think helped me in, in law school and how I approached, you know, sort of my studies there as well. Well, that is awesome to hear. A, a common thing we hear from students is, oh, I'm not going to grad school. I'm not going to be a professor. You know, maybe this isn't something I need to do. But common thing I hear from our guests on the show is no matter what you do, the thesis experience, no matter what your topic, can be useful. So I'm glad to hear that, Bob. Going back to what we were talking about with, you know, it was a sexy time with Wall Street, both the actual street and the film in the 80s. But you didn't take that path. How did you decide that you wanted to go to law school? You said you didn't have a liberal arts bent, and that's obviously there's a bit of a tradition for a lot of liberal arts majors to pursue law school, but you came at it from a business angle. What, yeah. What yeah. inspired that? Well, um, a, a, another common theme here, again, I had a business law class at Penn State, <laughs> you know, I think it was my junior year, and really saw the intersection between law and business. I mean, they are so related. Kind of interested in the law, but really one wanted to pursue business. And, you know, with that class, you know, came to the realization of, you know, I can go into law as a transactional, as a corporate lawyer, and still stay very much involved in business. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, CEOs are lawyers. It doesn't close a door by going to law school if you want to stay involved, engaged in business, and, and knew there was a path to do that. And so kind of pivoted to uh, to law school and pursued a track of, of corporate transactional securities work where I can work with companies companies and work with businesses and, you know, help them achieve their goals and solve their problems, you know, and, and, and that, that's what really energized me and, and kind of my work in, in law school. So, Bob, what would you say to uh, especially a student in SMEAL who's interested in law school, but really any Schreier scholar or any Penn State student, what would you what kind of advice would you give them as they consider if that's something they want to invest in? I think, you know, the scholars program in particular, you know, I think, again, the, the rigor of the thesis, obviously, the opportunity it gave me and I think it would encourage all those, this, you know, current scholars to take advantage of the broad curriculum. I mean, it let me go outside of my kind of business college of business programs. I took a great political science course that really just opened my eyes to sort of the world of politics and, and the history of politics. And, you know, I find it so important to kind of understand those other disciplines. But I think, you know, hey, you got to do the work, right? And that's always, that, that in, particularly in law school, but I think the habits you develop as at Penn State and uh, in the scholars program are, are going to pay off for you. You know, you develop good habits. You have to do the work. Uh, you know, think critically. Think globally. Don't don't just kind of put your blinders on and you know, hey, I'm I'm this major. That's all I'm going to focus on. But be open to other other subject matters, other disciplines. Take some other courses because that perspective, particularly when business and I think particularly in law, uh, is very helpful. So that that would you know that'd be my advice. Excellent. I think that is really sound. Now, Bob, you, like many of our students who go on to law school, decide to, you know, try out a different university, and especially our scholars go on to a lot of great law schools across the country. You know, you you grew up in Sharon, you said, come to University Park, but then you go to a major metro area like Washington, D.C. So how did you adjust? Because I know we've got plenty of scholars who come from rural areas, small towns, and they could probably relate to that experience as they contemplate, whether it's for law school or just a job in their next steps after college. College. Yeah, much, much different campus, um, an urban campus for sure at George Washington University. I, I think at the graduate level, particularly in, in law school, at least what I can speak to, it's less of a social scene. So I think that the sort of dynamic, it is, you know, particularly in your first year, you know, you are in the library a lot, you're studying a lot. You I mean, it, it, you have those other, those distractions just aren't there on the social side. You know, you tend to focus on your studies more. I, you know, you, I, I worked after my first year in law school and worked during my second year. So you start to have a more, you know, my like a professional life, uh, you know, other than just going to school. And so DC offered a lot of opportunities for that, obviously, a lot of law firms, a lot of, you know, the government and so forth. So it did provide a lot of opportunities, but it, it was more college life was over and it's more, you know, now it's, it's kind of just your studies, your work. And so it was a little different, uh, I guess, vibe than 
you know, than sort of undergraduate experience. So I, yes, a very different, but, uh, you know, University Park, like we said, it's a big campus, you know, you, you kind of got to use your, your street smarts and all that other stuff. I mean, I, DC was no different. And uh, so it was, you know, it was an easy, it was an easy transition. You know, we had a Metro there in DC, didn't have that in University Park, but, <laughs> but otherwise, you know, you kind of stuck to your studies, you did your work and, you know, I, I, it was, it was an easy transition for me. Now you've talked about like, when you go to law school, you really need to buckle down. You got to put in the work, but specifically the how of that, what strategies did you use that might be helpful for a scholar who's headed to law school to get through, especially that, that one L year? Yeah. Uh, you know, try not to be distracted, obviously kind of, you know, you kind of know what you're, what you're there for. You got to do outlines. You got to, you know, you got to kind of plan out what you're going to do. You're not being spoon fed. You know, you have a final at the end of the, at the end of the year, and that's kind of what your grade is based on. So it is something you have to plan for and you have to digest a lot of information over that semester. And so, you know, if you're not kind of staying on top of things, staying ahead of things, you may read, you know, hundred pages a, a night and, you know, have to digest some cases. And if you fall behind, even for a few days, it's tough to dig out of that hole. So, you know, stay disciplined, uh, do the work uh, you, you ha and you have to plan ahead. And everyone, you know, I remember when I was there, it was very helpful to me. You got to do an outline. You know, you got to what, so it's something you can review at the end. It's also, I think, a good way to learn the information is, is just to reiterate, you know, you're, you're, you're going through it and organizing your thoughts and creating an outline. I think that was vital. And, you know, there's, you're going to be surrounded by a lot of other smart people, you know, folks that, you know, are at, at undergraduate school. And so, you know, collaborate and talk with them and listen to them and do study groups. And there's all different kinds of perspectives out there. And, and we tend to kind of be a little insular, but when you, you know, as you move on, I think collaboration is so important. So get with a study group and particularly I know in law school, kind of the debates you have on things, things aren't always uh, black and white. There's a lot of gray. And so, you know, just talking through things with people is very helpful. Yeah. You hear that phrase team of lawyers, right? Uh, right. In, in both in the news and in, and in works of fiction. So makes a lot of sense, you know, form a good study group. And then obviously do that for your undergrad classes as you're listening now. Absolutely. Now, you also mentioned in DC, of, of all places, there are so many professional opportunities, so many law firms are based there, have offices there, not to mention from lobbying firms to the government and all the different legal needs there. How did you approach all the professional opportunities that come up, whether it's internships, clerkships, and then ultimately, how did you pursue your first role coming out of law school? GW, like, you know, like Penn State had a, a good career development a group that put students onto a lot of opportunities. So really leverage that as, you know, starting in my first year. And, and, and what I try to do, I, I I uh, did a summer internship at a smaller law firm in D.C. after my first year, and then my second year worked at a larger firm in D.C., which ultimately has led to my first job out of GW. But I tried to approach it as sort of a try a variety of, of different settings, if you will. You know, I tried small practice, you know, learned a lot there at a small firm. It went to a larger firm, wanted to experience that and, and kind of and like that you know, like that setting. So, you know, leverage the resources you have at the school, you know, and again, this was before the job search boards and everything we have on the internet today, but it was a lot of postings and uh, interviews uh, on, on campus and, and things like that. Uh, and you'd be surprised, of course, the alumni open doors, right? And again, just like PSU, uh, alumni are, are different companies or law firms or what have you. I, one regret I had is I didn't really try a government position and being in DC, that would have been a natural and good opportunity, but I never, never did any government service, but I would encourage folks to, th that's your opportunity to try different things. So take advantage of it. That is really helpful, really helpful advice there. Now, ultimately, you, you said you went to a law firm to start off, but obviously, if you're reading the show notes, Bob, you've seen that you are in pretty much most of your career, you've been in the general counsel side of things on, on the company side. So how did you get back into that? You were, you said you always liked business, you know, it was kind of what you found at Penn State. How did you get back into that? How did you know it was the right time to make that switch? Yeah, so I had practiced uh, in at a law firm for about six, seven years, you know, where you work for a variety of companies, sort of, you know, any all small businesses, large businesses, kind of whatever comes in the door. And I was doing general corporate and real estate and, you know, transactional work. But, you know, I got to the point in my law practice where I kind of wanted the opportunity to really get involved into a, a business and get to, you know, get to know a business and, you know, kind of focus on it. And so through, you know, kind of headhunters and that, that call on, on occasion, took an opportunity here in Chicago. And that's what really caused me to move out to the Midwest 
last year for an in-house role, a corporate counsel role, and uh, doing a lot of what I did in private practice, but again, just for one for one company and being able to kind of focus on it, be vested in sort of the the success or failures of that company. It, it and again, this is kind of where my business kind of bent is never went away, and and so I really wanted to get back into uh, kind of corporate life. And from that point on, I think that was in '95. Uh, I've been in house uh, ever since, and and just like the dynamics, you know, of the in house practice and and working with business professionals and and legal professionals. And I've been fortunate in my career, uh, you know, to work at some large companies with very sophisticated law departments and smaller groups. And I just continue to learn a lot from all the the great business folks that I work with all the time. Fantastic. Now, Bob, I've had quite a few lawyers on this show. And something that I've picked up from our conversations is that, you know, if you are on the law firm side, the business is only going to call you up and they're only going <laughs> to really bring you in when they need you for <laughs> mergers and acquisitions yeah. or a lawsuit, defense yeah. of, a, of IP, something like that. But being in-house, you're around all the time. You're on call <laughs> and right. you are often called on to be a subject matter expert on a whole bunch of things. So how do you, you know, first of all, what kind of things have you overseen? Like what are the different job functions, responsibilities that you're responsible for? And then the ones that you didn't know anything about, maybe something technical, something new like ESG, how do you learn and keep your skills and knowledge fresh on those spaces? Yeah, it's law is never boring. And, you know, business changes all the time, competitive pressures, geopolitical pressures, uh, you know, it's just, it's a very fast moving environment. And and frankly, that's what I like about it. it. It's never boring. It's never the same thing. And, you know, as I moved up the ladder in my career and had taken more broader responsibility for a legal department or, you know, import export compliance or, you know, kind of ESG, like you mentioned, environmental social governance, which is really becoming a hot topic. You know, one, I, I come to rely on a lot of subject matter experts. I mean, I've, again, been fortunate to work with a lot of great professionals who know patents and know IP and, you know, know import export regulations, you know, to very great degree. And when we need to pick up the firm, call to call the law firms, pick up the phone and call the law firms who have very deep expertise in particular areas, particularly, you know, litigation, you have some antitrust litigation or something, you really need some specialists to help you and and knowing who to call and, you know, working with them is a big part of my, my job and helping the company manage those outside firms. Uh, obviously, we try to do as much as we can in-house, you know, with, with our teams. And I think a big part of an in-house lawyer's role is issue spotting, you know, so may not have all the answers, May not know, you know, the regulation, but know enough to say, wait a minute, this could be a problem, or we need to look at that, and then, you know, bringing in the subject matter experts as you need them. But you know, 80% of the stuff, you know, you tend to triage and you know make a call on, you know, based on the risk and you know that type of thing, or you go research in that. But you know, really, it's issue spotting, uh, knowing kind of when to ask the right questions, uh, when to pursue uh, something with an outside firm, or you know, maybe do a little more more work on. And you know, obviously, staying up to date on on what's happening. Again, in a global economy with you know global companies, you have to cover a lot of jurisdictions. So that's a big part of my day as well as kind of staying on top of some of the changes that are going on in the legal world and geopolitical uh, environment. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like the general and general counsel is like, you know, kind of a <laughs> jack of all trades. You need to have a general understanding of just about anything, right? Yeah. yeah. It, and and I think um, being able to apply that in a business setting where, you know, nothing is risk-free. And while I represent the company, the company is my client, there are business goals we're trying to achieve. And, you know, we always have to balance the risk with the benefits of how we achieve a business goal. So we try not to tell our business clients, no, you can't do that, but rather we'd like to say, well, you know, can we do it this way and maybe mitigate some of our risk, you know, and, and the earlier we can get involved in those conversations, you know, more value we can add as an internal team, because we do understand the business so well. We live it every day and, you know, being able to engage with them early and help them shape 
a transaction or instead of going down one path, you choose a different path that can reduce risk or you know, provide a, an easier, maybe more economical way to do something. It's really uh, fruitful for me to be able to do something like that. You know, Bob, it's almost like I think you were in my head because the, the next thing I really wanted to ask was about that kind of the duality being the general counsel. So you're leading the legal side of the company, but you're also on the executive team and you have to balance those business functions and the legal functions. And sometimes they may be lined up and sometimes they may be at odds. So can you talk a little bit more about how you balance that if they are and how you fit into that C-suite? Yeah. Yeah. No, that a very uh, you know good question. And you know this whole notion of business ethics was really starting to develop in, in the 80s and that is a real discipline. And I've been fortunate in, in that you know the, the executive teams and the business folks I work with, I have always been very high integrity and, you know, you never have to have the conversation where you say, you know, I'll have to quit if we do that. I've always worked with folks of high integrity and, you know, would, would find it difficult, you know, to be in a different situation. But nevertheless, you you still have to make the, that balance. And, you know, as a in-house lawyer, we're always, we can always go to our board of directors. You know, we could, we, you know, that again, the corporation is our client, but we deal every day with the executives, like you say. So, you know, I think educating, you know, when when, when issues do come up, I think educating our clients on the risks and, you know, potential pitfalls and, and, and that of a certain path for me has always been the way to approach those kind of thorny issues. This, this, hey, well, great, I you know, understand we're trying to do. There's some significant risk here or something we may need to discuss with the board to make sure they appreciate it or maybe discuss with our CEO or, you know, kind of escalating that up the ladder, if you will, to make sure that we're being very transparent about what we're doing, the right decision maker at the right level has made that call. Again, I've never been in the situation where we've crossed the line, but typically you get up to the right decision maker. We all appreciate that our reputation and good name, you know, <laughs> is not is not worth a particular sale or the, you know, a transaction or something. It's it's just too risky and our our reputation is worth too much than to try to cut a corner. So, you know, sometimes things come up uh, but I, like I said, you always find you escalate it, you explain the risk, and rational heads always tend to prevail when you're working with good people. Well, I would expect nothing less from a scholar alum, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. What I get, thank you. So we talked about working on the C-suite team, but you also obviously oversee a large team in, in your function as the general counsel. What are the things that you wish your employees, come, like your new, your new staff were coming with that scholars could begin to work on now to set themselves apart? as they start job searching, whether it's straight out of undergrad or perhaps they have a pit stop at grad school, law school, med school along the way? You know, I think it's so important for anyone, uh, you know, on a team in business, we've talked about collaboration skills. You know, uh, again, that's something you can, you, know, you start to hone, whether you're a member on an athletic team or, you know, an academic team or a study group or, you know, just being able to work with people and collaborate. Uh, that's so important in business and law and, you know, I think in life. So, you know, those collaboration skills to translate what you know, you may be an expert in the technical field, you know, you may have a PhD, but you have to be able to communicate that to maybe an accountant or a lawyer <laughs> who doesn't have that technical, but, you know, how, you need to be able to, to communicate well and kind of break down complex issues, you know, so they can be understood and, and you know, working with your team. So I, I think that's so important, you know, solution orientation, again, it, particularly in a, in a business setting, you, you can't just say, here's the problem, here's the problem, here's the problem, you know, it, but how can you help solve the problem? And so, you know, you have to have that kind of mindset. And, you know, a lot of folks that that I see and in, in kind of coming into the corporate world, you know, I, I find sometimes doesn't, they don't have the sort of the emotional intelligence um, that's needed in a company. And, and that's really how you read people. And, you know, there's probably not a class, maybe there is now these days on, on emotional intelligence in, in, in business school or, you know, it's meal, but that's just so important to how you read a room, what drives people, you know, having empathy, you know, we deal with people and you have to motivate people. You have to read people. If you're in a negotiation, you deal with a lot of different disciplines and people come from a lot of different backgrounds. And, and so that's so important for me when I kind of look at people coming into the organization, you know, are they, do they have that emotional intelligence, which is to me, you know, so much important than IQ necessarily, if, if you don't have those, you know, those 
those skills. You know, and I think lastly, I, I, and I know the world has changed a lot since I was uh, at Penn State in the scholars program, but thinking globally, uh, obviously, you know, that's so important in the world we live in. Y you have to be able to understand cultures and ways business are done and, you know, just how the world works and business for that matter. I remember one of my early professors uh, when I was a sophomore, I uh, had said, go get a subscription to the Wall Street Journal. You know, now we have all kinds of alternatives online, but kind of start to learn how business works and finance works and, you know, frankly, how the, how, how the world transacts. And, uh, you know, we hear a lot about the Fed and well, what does that mean? You got to kind of have a, it's good to have kind of appreciation for a lot of that stuff, particularly as you go into the business world. You know, it was funny, tying back to your comments about your thesis, you were talking about how interest rates were in the news and it's like, was that 1983 yeah. or 2023? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It all comes comes around. Always comes back. That's right. It's fairly <laughs> exactly. cyclical. Yeah. And I think you make a great point about EQ, Bob. Like businesses businesses don't function without people. They people are employees, people are customers. And, and knowing how to manage up, down, and across is is how you get things done. Uh you obviously need your technical acumen, but the people skills, yeah. man. That is, yeah, for sure. For sure. That's how yep. you get it done. So I have a couple of questions here. I'm gonna set up with this phrase. Your company is a supplier for Apple, but unlike Apple is not necessarily a household name. So I have a couple of questions. So iPhone does not happen without your inputs, <laughs> right? Yeah, so yeah. first, what is it like working for a really successful company that doesn't have that brand recognition for the average person or a student walking around the career fair at the Bryce Jordan Center. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it takes a lot of explaining who we are, what we do. So I'll always have to kind of have my elevator speech ready for, you know, when I tell my work at Knowles and, and kind of what we do. You know, fortunately, well before my time, you know, the company has developed a reputation in, in our field of, of being a leader. Uh, you know, we were we started in the 1940s, you know, with with hearing and hearing aids and putting receivers, you know, any kind of small microphone or receiver is where we get involved. So I'm sure we're both talking on microphones, uh, more than likely from Knowles. We, we were in smartphones and the smart speakers and, you know, the the wireless earbuds and, you know, all of that. It's it's some wonderful technology and it's it's an area where we are known as a leader. So, you know, in our field for kind of business as a business to business, uh, as opposed to business to consumer type company, uh, we're very well known. And so uh, it's, you know, it's easy in the technical industry to, to say we're from Knowles and kind of doors open and, you know, we, we don't need to explain that. But so for the engineers who are looking for a job in acoustics or electrical engineers, I think our reputation will precede us in those areas in terms of our fellows and, you know, research and all that. So I feel very good about that. But it is, we're not a, we're not a brand name and we, we work with all the, the big global brands in this, in this industry industry and does take a little explaining each time to tell them a little bit about what we do and that you know they probably have a couple dozen of our microphones throughout their house and don't and don't know it yeah i bet there's a good chance you've got a headset <laughs> on i've got the same mic i've been using since started this so there's a good chance yeah. there's probably some parts <laughs> that you've developed for sure so your company is b2b as you said business to business and so how does that impact your recruiting for employees and and particularly for scholars who are maybe junior seniors they're kind of in the tail end of their experience mm -hmm. fourth fifth year and regardless of what their major is because there's so many you know you might be an engineering firm but there's obviously hr there's legal there's you know supply chain folks every company has different needs even despite what their expertise is. So how can they find opportunities at firms like yours that are that B2B famous, but are not B2C famous? You know, we, um, pr you know, happy to say we do recruit at Penn State. Uh, you know, we have a number of Penn State alumni uh, at Knowles and, and a lot of different fields. We also, um, you know, sponsor, you know, some scholarships in the, the College of Engineering there as well. But, you know, we are in, you know, so I would say campus recruiting for sure. Uh, look for us. We're on the job boards. We tend to post things on LinkedIn uh, as well, take advantage of that. And, you know, don't, again, don't underestimate alumni connections. There's through LinkedIn and all the social stuff. Now it's easy to identify folks and companies and, you know, I would encourage, uh, you know, folks in the, in the program uh, or undergrads, graduate students to, uh, you know, reach out to alumni at Knowles and, uh, you know, happy to help. We do have an internship program. That's a great opportunity for people to experience Knowles. We had a couple of Penn State grads in the past. Uh, I think it was the, they were in the graduate programs, you know, been through our internship internship program in the summer. So we have a pretty robust program there. would encourage folks to, again, through on-campus programs to, to get in touch with us. Awesome. And if you're a current scholar, obviously make sure you're taking advantage of career services. You mentioned you use that in law school at GW while you're here at Penn State. Obviously, you've got 
the Honors College if you're a scholar. You've got the Bank of America Career Services centrally for all Penn State students, and then whatever your home college or campus is. So whether you're at Penn State Abington, if you're in the Smeal College business, you have career services opportunities that you can leverage. So and I, I think your point about LinkedIn is great because that's where you're going to find these companies that maybe the names just don't jump out at you, but are great opportunities for you to look at. Absolutely. And and of course, I'd offer, you know, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, Knowles uh, is, is, we have a pretty robust website and tells you a lot about what we do and the type of things we do uh, and would encourage anyone, you know, kind of take a look at that. And if I can kind of help with any information in that, that feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Be happy to, to talk to folks. Perfect. I don't have to ask that question at the end now. <laughs> there you go. All right. <laughs> Good. Well, we still have a few, a few more questions here uh, and one more about kind of the, the actual work that you do and, and the teams you lead. What is it like for you and your pl- employees dealing with a company like Apple? And, and obviously, you also probably work with the government and plenty of other companies that you supply. But knowing that you those companies have like trillion dollar market caps or close to at this point, what is that like for your co- company and your employees dealing with that? Yeah. And uh, we're in uh, outside of con- you know kind of consumer electronics. We're very big into med tech and aerospace and defense, and like you say, work with a lot of Fortune 100 companies, the the big behemoths in all of those industries. And you know, in my career, when I was in the automotive uh, area, you know, again, you kind of deal with all the big automakers and that. And you know, one thing I found uh, in common in the, all those situations is that you know, these companies really push their suppliers to do more, do better. You know, they are always looking for an edge and in the, in the, marketplace. So they're really pushing you to for better technology. You know, how can we make this, you know, this widget have more features, uh, you know, cheaper? How can we make it, you know, something that is really a a big advantage to them? So, you know, they really, uh, they really challenge you to come up with better products. Uh, They force you to have better processes because they, they, you know, they are looking for cost savings and efficiency and that. So, you know, makes your operations organization so vital to make sure you have a lean operation. Uh, Your quality has to be, you know, world-class. Your, your maybe 10 cent, you know, uh, component that's going into one of their products can really harm their reputation if it doesn't work and they have to, you know, get, get their product returned. Or in some of our applications, they're going in pacemakers, they're going in, you know, life critical type devices. You know, when you're dealing with some of the big companies, their quality, their name is on the line. Like you say, they may not know Knowles in the, in the consumer world, but they know, you know, some of these big brands and if something doesn't work, it's the brand that takes a hit. So, you know, they push us to be world-class and quality process, you know, the best technology. So it makes us a better company. I mean, you know, no, you know, we complain sometimes that they're being tough on us, but, you know, it really pushes us to be a world-class supplier. And then that opens doors to other customers. You know, when we can tell them that we're supplying X, Y, and Z, you know, big, big companies like that for a smaller company or someone trying to get into the, in the field, uh, it really opens some doors for us because we do have the quality certifications. We, you know, we have the lean processes, we have the quality controls. And, uh, and so it's really, you know, it's a plus when you get when you get involved at that level. That's really cool. Uh, thank you for that. So pivoting a little bit to you now from all of our talk about microphones, business processes, and being lean. So you grew up in Pennsylvania, as we've talked about, but you've now made your home and your career elsewhere, first in D.C., but primarily out in Illinois. So what advice would you give to scholars whose path takes them in a similar route, whether it's Illinois or North Carolina or Nevada, California or anywhere around the world? You know, I would say be flexible, be open to opportunities. You know, if I would, uh, would think back to when I was maybe junior, senior at Penn State and thinking about where my, my kind of career path would take me both personally and professionally, is sort of what my life, I would have never guessed, you know, kind of where I am and what I'm doing. So you have to be open to opportunities. I've been on the East Coast and kind of moved out to the Midwest. And, you know, so be open to that. Uh, you know, you won't be there forever. If it's something, you try something, there's other opportunities around, you know, you, you, know, you gain experience. Experience, I think with every with every move. For me, like Sharon, for example, you know, it was a smaller community, didn't have as many opportunities. So, you know, it was one of the reasons my first jobs were kind of away from the area. So, you know, I'd make my plug for Chicago. I think the Midwest is a great air place to practice law and live. It's a, a very livable city. But I would just say be open to opportunities. Uh, don't foreclose, particularly if you're young, y- younger, newer in your career. You're really going to get some different experiences, and and that does help you 
you know, professionally and, and, you know, it's kind of, you build your resume and take some different opportunities. That is really good advice, Bob. And another piece of advice I'd like to ask you on behalf of our students, and many of them are very much traditional age between 18 and 23. So what is the one thing you would suggest to a current scholar to set themselves up for a successful career that they could be doing now as a scholar that, you know, if you could just pick one, whether it's in life, law or business, what, which, what would you tell them? You know, it's a, um, it's a be humble uh, and and maybe I'm being a little little coy, but I think that means listening instead of talking a lot. You know, kind of learning, be open, uh, learn, be curious, think broadly and critically about things. But be humble. I mean, there's a lot you can learn from people, from experiences, from cl- different classes, and you know, take that in. Approach the world and your career that way, and you know, you learn a lot, and um, you will contribute in that way. I will wholeheartedly echo that there, Bob. <laughs> Wonderful. Good. So something I've learned to start asking is in the same way of being humble, because I don't know everything. I've had to be a generalist as the host of the show. What is something I didn't think to ask you about that would have been helpful in our conversation here or thinking of it another way? What's a, a really common question that you get from student mentees or interns that you wouldn't share here. Yeah, that's uh, well, we've covered a lot of ground here, but I and I think the one I get the most you may I think you've asked in, in so many words is like I get what do you do exactly? <laughs> you know, they've heard general counsel and okay, I'm a lawyer, but what what do you do in a company? You know, how does that work? And do you go to court? And you know, typically do not go to court. Uh, you know, you have to be licensed in the jurisdiction where you actually have to litigate a matter. So, you know, unless the matter's here in Illinois in my district and that I'm, you know, I'm not going to go to court on that experience. So, we hire people, but it's kind of like, what do you do exactly? And so I'm glad you gave me a little bit of opportunity to talk about you know, the role of a general counsel. And, you know, I like to think we wear a lot of different hats and compliance and business person and, and legal advisor and, and all of that. And so always end up explaining that, you know, to our people, to folks that ask me and, you know, some of our, in our internship programs, we have an opportunity to meet with our interns and uh, I always kind of walk through, you know, what we do and, and the hats, different hats that we wear and, and why legal and compliance is, is a big part of business. Awesome. Well, I'm glad I, I thought to ask that. So <laughs> pat myself on the back. You're right. So, Bob, I'm going to move into our kind of last set of questions here. And these are the ones I asked everybody. And this is your chance to brag here. What would you say is your biggest success to date? Uh, well, uh, obviously, personally, uh, it's, you know, being married to my beautiful wife of 35 years now, and also a Penn State alum. I, I'll add, I met her, met her on campus and, and raising our, you know, three wonderful children. So it doesn't get much better than that. Professionally, uh, you know, I, I don't know if there's any one thing I'd I'd point to, but being able to, you know, I think lead a, you know, high functioning group of legal professionals, you know, getting the respect of your colleagues is, is, I can't think of any greater compliment than that. So I think, you know, having, hopefully achieving that, being viewed as a trusted business partner by my business colleagues, Uh, again, again, from an in-house lawyer, you know, I can't think of a greater compliment is when one of your you know, business colleagues comes and ask you a question. It's not purely legal, but just kind of wants to throw something by you and get your advice. And, you know, you're able to provide some help there on a, maybe somewhat of a business level. So being a trusted advisor, I think, and and particularly the GC role, public company that's, you know, global, it's a lot of issues and work with a lot of smart people and, and gaining their trust is, I think, a, a, a big success for me. I, I think those are both great. And I love that you <laughs> picked both personal and professional. So <laughs> yeah. kudos. On the flip side, though, Bob, I always like to ask, you know, what was the biggest mistake that you've made or a transformational learning moment, something, and most importantly, what you took from that experience that would be helpful for scholars? Again, probably, I, I don't know about one moment, but I, I'd kind of go back to this emotional intelligence. I, I, I just, and I think coming out of law school, you know, I, I was kind of like, hey, I know everything, you know, hey, let me tell you. And, you know, d- diving in to, to confront people in negotiations or in a deal or, you know, some litigation or something that I was involved in and then finding out that, you know what, that can backfire. And I'm not sure I'm serving my client's interests by, you know, raising my voice and, you know, trying to pursue something. And and one of the reasons I like transactional work, particularly M&A type work is, you know, both sides want to get to a deal and you have to kind of tease out what's important for both sides. Sometimes it's not mutually exclusive. You know, there can be a win, you know, the classic win-win situation, but how you get there, you know, how you tease that out in, in, in the context of a negotiation, sometimes a, you know, very tough negotiation. So for me, the, the biggest learning moment, again, was, you know, just kind of 
you have to understand people, what motivates them. And sometimes you got to step back a bit and uh, maybe put a couple cards on the table or, you know, kind of listen to what's important to them. And, and it's, it's not, I win, you lose always. And so going with that kind of mindset is, I think it's kind of helped me in my career and it's been a big learning uh, ha-ha moment for me. Absolutely. And that probably applies to just about every profession. So <laughs> yeah, that's really probably helpful. right. So the main point of this entire podcast, Bob, is that it's essentially mentorship on demand. And we actually haven't really talked about mentorship in our conversation. So I want to ask, how do you suggest that students be a quality mentee and a quality mentor? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, that that's a tough question, I think, because, uh, you know, it kind of depends on the mentor and the mentee. I've always found the kind of best match there just kind of comes kind of naturally, if you will. I, I've been in programs where it's very structured and, you know, you're kind of assigned mentors, mentees and that. But the best experience I've had is both as a mentee and a mentor has kind of developed naturally, you know, working with someone and, you know, just you, know, you have sort of, um, you kind of relate and can you feel you can help the person or you can gain something from the experience, but, you know, it's not a forced kind of structured arrangement. So look for opportunities. You know, you, you may talk with someone outside your discipline or you meet someone, you know, and if you kind of have that rapport, you know, ask them, say, hey, would you mind, let's, you know, can we get together, can I buy some coffee, you know, or can we just get together for lunch? I'd like to just talk to you about, you know, kind of career path and that. And, you know, I find in most cases, people love to talk about what they do and, you know, we'll be very open to that. So it doesn't have to be a real formal, you know, type of uh, relationship and, you know, let's put them on the calendar five months out and all. just, it may be more natural and, and not, not too forced, but it, I think it is good to have someone kind of outside of your chain of command or your discipline kind of gives you a different perspective. Someone within your company though, I think is important because there are sort of those unwritten norms or sort of the political side of things that, you know, you're not going to find in the employee handbook or, you know, in some process, a, a written process. But that's the type of thing I think you want to find the mentor to help you uh, understand uh, kind of how that works in your company and your organization. And then, you know, in, in terms of professional development, I think it's always good to find someone who has, you know, done the things that you'd like to be able to do and kind of learn, you know, pick their brain about hey, how'd you get here? Some of, the, some of the things we're talking about, right? How'd you get here? What was important? And that stuff's just invaluable. Absolutely. And I love your point there about kind of the in-company mentor the person who can tell you, okay, this is what the handbook says, but this is how actually things <laughs> right, move. Right, right. You know, right. this person will not pick up a phone. This person doesn't respond to Teams or Slack messages. You know, this is how the coffee maker does not function <laughs> right. correctly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't be late for a meeting. That, that, you know, this guy does this person like that, and so there's every company has those. Every organization oh, yeah. has those. Has those. Yep. Yeah. This person's always late for a meeting. This person's always <laughs> right. early. Right. Yep. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So find those people, no matter. Even in your internship, find that. And even in your student organization, I think that'll be helpful too, because those those are their own flavor. Now, Bob, you've referenced a couple of faculty that you've had. Is there any professors or your friends, especially your friend group from Chenango, that you wanted to give a shout out to? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, for sure. Uh, my uh, advisor for my for my thesis and and sort of my my finance mentor was uh, Professor Randy Woolridge, and you know, I he was just a young professor at the time, and and uh, I know he's still very involved in Spiel Spiel College, and really, again kind of what he helped me with in my thesis is, you know, someone never had done that before and the professionalism and the, the academic kind of challenges that he posed in finance, it really impressed me and kept me engaged in the corporate world and, and that. So, you know, sh big shout out to him. And the other, the other professor I'd mentioned is uh, Frank Evans. He was my accounting professor at Shenango Valley campus when I was there. And, and I think he, yeah, he's the one that gave me advice to read the Wall Street Journal, but he also helped me with an internship when I I was there and, you know, got me engaged in, in the business side of things. So it was a, just a great, great practitioner and, and professor. I think he was an, a, a part-time professor, an adjunct there at the time, but really cared about students and um, and helped me a lot. That's awesome. And I think Dr. Woolridge is still on faculty or may have just retired, but uh, we'll make sure that he gets to hear this. Uh, and to your point about the Wall Street Journal, I know we, as, as Penn State students, you have access to so many things like the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and other publications. So make sure you
sure you're taking advantage of those because somebody listened to your to your professor, Dr. Evans, and made that available for all students uh, at some point along the way. Now, is there any final pieces of advice that you wanted to share? You've shared a lot of really helpful things from your career, but is there one last thing that you were itching to share that maybe just didn't come up? No, I mean, I just, I would reiterate for folks, you know, develop, this is the opportunity to develop good habits, take advantage of the opportunities the scholars program offered. Uh, I, I feel that I did uh, at the time and really, you know, kind of broaden my horizons about what's out there in the world and, you know, opportunities that I could pursue, you know, just think broadly and critically, think any discipline, law, business, you know, whatever, wherever you end up, you know, have some critical analytical skills and do the work and develop good habits. This is the time to kind of do that. I will certainly echo that. Now, you've already mentioned that scholars can connect with you on LinkedIn. They can also find your company on LinkedIn and you should give them a follow if that's something of interest to you. So we'll skip that question that I always ask. <laughs> and we'll jump right to the final one, which is uh, a really fun one here. And hopefully you got a chance to look at the menu, Bob. If you were a flavor <laughs> of Berkey Creamery ice cream, which would you be? And as a scholar alum, <laughs> why would you be that flavor? Uh -huh. now, I, I didn't have to look at the menu. I know the flavors, believe me. <laughs> it's one of my favorite. I would, uh, I, I think I'd be peachy paterno and a couple reasons. First, reminds me of summer, peaches and, and one of my favorite seasons. So so that was a natural. I think it's, you know, nothing fancy, you know, kind of a classic flavor. I think it's been around for, I don't know, since I've been there, at least till the 80s, I remember. And so just a classic flavor gets the job done. Nothing fancy, but it will. It's good ice cream. Uh, and lastly, you know, if there had to be a nationality for ice cream, I would assume it's Italian American. I'm Italian American, so I can relate to uh, Peachy Paterno. So I would. That would be the other reason I'd pick it. That is a great reason. And we have <laughs> another entry in Team Menu on this question. And I agree with you, Bob. I think it's such a classic <laughs> summer flavor. It's not what I right. want in winter, but in like July and August, it it, it's the spot. It's perfect. Yeah, perfect. I don't know if it's one of their uh, one of their class one of their favorite flavors. Uh, probably vanilla is, but it's been around a long time, and uh, yeah, it's it's my favorite. I think it's one of the staples. I think that is a yeah. year round flavor. There are many that are seasonal yeah. and they rotate through. I think Peachy Paterno is uh, all all year long. So, uh, but <laughs> yeah, I think good, it definitely, good. definitely fits the bill in in the hot months of summer more than, more than <laughs> yeah. some other flavors. So, well, Bob Perna, thank you so much for joining us uh, all the way from the Chicagoland area. Really appreciate all of your insights on just having a successful career overall, and then particularly on what exactly a general counsel is and the different paths and, and opportunities to get into that and even other careers in law. So thank you so much for all of your time and wisdom today. Yeah. I'm my pleasure, Sean. Thank you. You made this very easy, and uh, this is a great way to, to reach scholars, and I appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk a little bit about, you know, kind of what worked for me and, and hope it helps folks. Thank you, scholars, for listening and learning with us today. We hope you will take something with you that will contribute to how you shape the world. This show proudly supports the Schreier Honors College Emergency Fund, benefiting scholars experiencing unexpected financial hardship. You can make a difference at raise.psu.edu forward slash Schreier. Please be sure to hit the relevant subscribe, like, or follow button on whichever platform you are engaging with us on today. You can follow the college on Instagram and LinkedIn to stay up to date on news, events, and deadlines. If you have questions about the show or are a Scholar alum who'd like to join us as a guest here on Following the Gone, please connect with me at scholaralumni at psu.edu. Until next time, please stay well, and we are 